Hello, everybody. I'm Alessandro Ricottone, and I work as a research, research scientist for Litecore developing the LISC protocol. Today, I want to talk about LISC interoperability, and the title of my talk is Cross-Chain Interactions Between Homogeneous State Machines. This is the outline. First, I will just talk about uh, cross-chain certification in general, introducing the problem and uh, making a brief comparison between the LISC solution and the industry. Then we'll focus on the LISC ecosystem and explain how chains connect to each other in the LISC ecosystem and what is the state model of a LISC chain. Finally, I will uh, uh, zoom in on cross-chain updates and cross-chain messages, which are uh, the elementary data structures that we use in the LISC interoperability protocol to allow chains to exchange information with each other. So let's start with a 10,000 feet overview of interoperability. Among other solutions, two notable ones are uh, multi shards architecture and independent chains uh, architecture. Here, I don't want to focus on the details which may differ between uh, each particular instance of these solutions, but just look at the general features. In a multi shard architecture, all chains that are connected with each other share the same state which is partition among them. Um, usually these chains are called shards, uh, and these shards submit block to main chain validators that verify all state transitions from uh, the shards block. This means that uh, when one of the shards wants to reorganize, or in general, when the system uh, needs to reorganize, everything has to reorganize uh, together. And two notable example, with you know, some differences between them are Polkadot and Ethereum. In contrast, I want to compare this multi shards architecture to indep an independent chain's architecture. Uh, in this type of solution, each chain has a separate state and uh, a separate state transition function. And uh, in particular, they also have an independent set of validator that are able to verify and finalize blocks independently from each other. Um, here, each chain can reorganize independently from each other. And uh, again, notable example for this type of solution are Cosmos and LISC, about which I would like to talk about today. So uh, let's focus now on uh, cross-chain certification, which is the way in which chains exchange information with each other in this independent chain architecture. On this slide, I'm I have uh, two chains, chain one and chain two. And uh, in general, chain one will trust information from chain two because of these cross-chain certificates. These cross-chain certificates are data structures containing information about chain two, signed by validators of chain two and submitted on chain one. Usually, this uh, submission process and sometimes also the certificate creation is done by relayers which are just network participants in charge of this uh, you know, actual exchange process. The certificates, among other properties, usually contain a state root, which is just uh, could be a short hash of the, or the root of a Merkle tree that authenticates the state transitions that happen on chain two. Certificates also contain the signature of active validators um, that are just the validators that are uh, authorized to sign these certificates. And uh, furthermore, sometimes they also contain update about future validators in case of a change in validator set, so that this trust, chain of trust uh, is always maintained. In this example, uh, for instance, uh, on chain two, we have uh, two transactions, and then a certificate created uh, from a block after these two transactions happen, which is posted on chain one. From then on, transactions on chain one can depend on the state of chain two after the transactions on chain two happen. And in this way, we have this information exchange and dependency between chains. Cross-chain certifications in LISC follows this general pattern. On this slide here, I'm showing uh, a typical interaction between a sidechain and the main chain. Again following uh, the previous uh, idea, 
the main chain trust information from the sidechain because of certificates that in our solution can be created directly from block finalized block headers. Certificates are then packed together with cross-chain messages into a cross-chain update. A cross-chain message is just uh, you know, information that can be spawned by a transaction and uh, executed directly in the target chain, which we think is a uh, specific feature of our interoperability protocol. This cross-chain update contains an aggregated BLS signature of active validators that, uh, again, are the set of validators authorized to sign this certificate. And uh, this interaction is completely symmetric, meaning that a transaction on the main chain can emit a cross-chain message that, together with a certificate from, for the, from the main chain, can be included in an update that is posted on the side chain. OK, so um, to give some more details, cross-chain certificates have the following properties. The block ID is just the identifier of the block header from which the certificate was created. And the height and timestamp are properties of this block header that are used to validate the certificate. The idea is that, of course, you can only post a certificate if it is more recent than a previous one from the sending chain. As I mentioned, the state root is there to authenticate the state of the sending chain. And the validator hash is a short uh, hash that authenticates the set of future validators. Um, and as I mentioned before, the BLS signature is just an aggregated signature from the current validator set. The LISC ecosystem is a, a set of homogeneous chains created with the LISC SDK. The LISC SDK is our product that allows you to create uh, a sidechain can, that can be connected to the ecosystem while already following the interoperability protocol. The main chain is the central point of the ecosystem, meaning that every sidechain has to first connect to the main chain and register on the main chain to receive an ID and register their name in order to participate into interoperability. All cross-chain updates, by default, are routed by the main chain, meaning that uh, a sidechain will uh, authenticate its state with a certificate on the main chain, and another sidechain will authenticate the state of the main chain with a certificate, and in doing so, will indirectly authenticate the state of the first sidechain. This is the default, default behavior, but it is possible to open direct channels between sidechains to exchange updates directly. The sidechain registration process as I mentioned, happens on the main, on the main chain. It's a transaction that sidechain developers can cast on the main chain. And in doing so, they set the name of their sidechain, the ID of the genesis block of the sidechain, which is used to compute the sidechain network ID, which is then used to validate certificates from the sidechain. And the first set of val sidechain validators that will be used uh, to validate the first update from the sidechain. After this has been done, the main chain can be registered on the sidechain. And in doing so, they communicate, again, the sidechain ID and the name that were computed during the sidechain registration, as well as setting the initial set of main chain validators to validate future updates from the main chain. So this process is symmetric in this sense. The only asymmetrical part is that first sidechains have to register on the main chain. During the registration process, some accounts are set in the state of the chain. The most important one is maybe the chain account for the other chain, which is set the chain ID, the name, network ID, as I mentioned before, and also maintain, maintains the last certificate from the partner chain. And this last certificate is just uh, uh, the data structure that holds the most updated state root, for instance, from the partner chain. And also, the status is a property uh, that identifies whether a chain account has been terminated or closed, if you want. But I'm not going to talk more about this. The second uh, data structure that is stored uh, in the state is the validator set, as I mentioned. So it's an array of validators with their BLS keys and BFT weight, since uh, uh, for certificates to be valid, a certain certificate threshold has to be reached 
and the BFT weight is used to calculate whether this threshold has been reached or not. And finally, uh, each pair of chains maintain a channel. And uh, this channel contains an inbox and an outbox, which are append-only Merkle trees. When uh, cross-chain messages uh, are spawned in the sending chain, they get appended to the outbox, which is, you know, it is a Merkle tree, so the root of the outbox authenticates all the messages that were sent by the chain towards the other receiving chain. So in this case, CCM6 is uh, emitted and appended to the Merkle tree, to the outbox tree, updating the outbox root. When the CCU is received in the receiving chain, the same message is appended to, to the inbox so that the inbox and the outbox has to have to be in sync with each other and kind of follow each other and have the same root when all messages have been appended. This means in particular that messages will be processed in a strict order, um, one after the other. As I mentioned before, all, all chains in the LISC ecosystem are uh, homogeneous in the sense that they are created with the LISC SDK or they can be created with the LISC SDK. And uh, in particular, uh, every chain maintains uh, a state and calculates the state root using a sparse uh, Merkle tree called the state tree. Each entry in the state corresponds to a leaf in the tree and then uh, this, uh, these entries get Merkleized into a state root and uh, this is pretty standard. This uh, sparse Merkle tree allows to prove efficiently that a certain entry has a, had a certain value. For instance, that Bob had a certain account balance can be proven efficiently by providing the hash in the path from Bob uh, account to the state root. The state tree is organized into several module, module subtrees. So each module defines its own generic key value map, and uh, they, are, um, and they identify separate sub subtrees in the state tree. Um, for instance, here I have uh, a subtree for the token module, a subtree for the interoperability module, which will hold the inbox and outbox in particular. And in general, developers can develop their own application modules with the LISC SDK, and uh, each one of these application modules will get its own separate key value map, which then will be Merkleized together into the state root. As I mentioned before, the interoperability module uh, contains the channel state in its state. This means in particular that the sidechain outbox and the sidechain outbox root in particular will be uh, located somewhere in the state tree. That means that cross-chain messages can be, uh, the inclusion of cross-chain messages in the sending chain can be authenticated directly from the outbox root to the state root with uh, an inclusion proof. Let, let's go back now to uh, cross-chain updates. And uh, I would like to show a typical life cycle of a cross-chain message and cross-chain update in the LISC ecosystem. We start in the sending chain where transaction, uh, just a generic state transitions, trigger the creation of cross-chain messages. These cross-chain messages are appended to, to the outbox of the sending chain, in, in particular in the channel between the sending and the receiving chain. Validators then create certificates from a certain finalized block, and the relayer collect certificate and the CCMs in a, a cross-chain update, which is then posted on the receiving chain. On this chain, uh, the CCMs can be executed directly, meaning that users can just send a cross-chain transaction, for instance, to uh, send tokens from the sending chain to the receiving chain by sending a transaction only on the sending chain. And then crediting them with the tokens on the receiving chain is done automatically because the cross-chain message is processed automatically in the receiving chain. There is no need to for instance, uh, include a proof against the state root of the sending chain that these tokens were locked in the sending chain. Uh, something important, as I mentioned before, is that by default, all cross-chain updates are routed by the main chain. 
This means that the sidechain will only have a channel with the main chain by default. And uh, cross-chain messages from the sidechain to any other chain in the ecosystem go first through the main chain channel in a CCU that is posted on the main chain. And then the main chain is uh, in charge of uh, routing these messages to the relevant channel. So the main chain, again, just to stress this, will contain a channel for each sidechain in the ecosystem. But sidechain, by default, only contain a channel with the main chain. Focusing now on cross-chain messages, cross-chain messages are in a way similar to transactions in the sense that they contain information to process a state transition. But very importantly, they don't need to be signed because the cross-chain update will be signed by the validators of the sending chain. Um, they have uh, several properties, like the nonce, which similar to transactions, is needed to identify a cross-chain message in the ecosystem. Module ID and asset ID, which are basically um, the values that are used to identify which state transition to process in, on the receiving chain. So before uh, sending a cross-chain message, the sending and receiving chain are, are kind of uh, agreeing on sharing the same uh, protocol to process a certain uh, cross-chain message with a certain module ID. Of course, this cannot be enforced on the sending chain, but it's some sort of shared uh, agreement uh, in the ecosystem to, to, to a certain module ID should correspond to a certain protocol. But this is not enforced like uh, what could be done uh, in Polkadot with the spray protocol or with a global smart contract, let's say, that is valid in the whole ecosystem. Um, the fee is just uh, uh, paid to the relayer, so it's a uh, uh, very similar to a transaction fee, but is paid to the relayer to reimburse them of the cost of posting the update in the other chain. The asset is just some generic raw bytes value that contains the transaction parameter. These raw bytes will be deserialized using the module ID and the asset ID to refer to the correct JSON schema to, for deserialization. Sending chain and receiving chain ID identify respectively the sending and receiving chain, and this is important because on the main chain, the main chain can route the message to the correct chain by reading the receiving chain ID. And finally, the status of a CCM contains some extra information about the CCM. This is because the CCM can be bounced on the receiving chain if an error occurs, for instance, and uh, when they error, the status is changed so that when they get back to the original chain, they can be processed correctly. And I will show an example of this. Just to give an example of a asset of a cross-chain message, this is the cross-chain token transfer asset. So when a cross-chain token transfer transaction is, uh, emitted, is uh, included in the sending chain, a cross-chain message for the token transfer is emitted and it will contain this asset. It contains all the properties that you may expect for a cross-chain token transfer. So it has the amount, the token ID that identifies the token being transferred, the recipient address, and the sender address which, as I mentioned before, is used for reimbursement if the message fails and is bounced back on the sending chain. And this data field which, uh, where a user can include extra information, like a message. Happy birthday. Finally, um, this uh, idea of using CCMs that get processed directly in the receiving chain allow us to have a very flexible um, you know, protocol in the sense that, in principle, modules can react to receiving cross-chain messages in a variety of ways. They can, uh, for instance, just process the token transfer, or an oracle chain could uh, react to an oracle request by sending several messages to several chains. Like uh, custom modules have the freedom to define the way in which they react to these messages. In this example, um, a message is sent to the receiving chain, and the processing this message in the receiving chain generates a new message, which is then sent back to the sending chain. And uh, to go back to the token example, this message could be an error message. For some reason, the transfer cannot be processed. Maybe it did not require the minimum balance. And the message is sent back to the sending chain, where it can be processed, because now the status has been updated, and the sender 
can be reimbursed. With this, I conclude and I thank you. And uh, please uh, let me know if you have any question. Thanks.